Uh, thanks. Um, uh, this is going to be a very different kind of talk than uh, than everything else you've heard. Um, it's it's uh, certainly the uh, more different than any talk I've ever given before. This is my first sort of talk of this of this nature. Um, a year and a half ago, I moved to the National Science Foundation, but before that, I had a sort of 20-ish year-long career doing large-scale structure and galaxy formation. Um, and I advised some student projects in machine learning and AI over the last few years, so I'm, I'm very interested in every, everything I've heard. Um, and I'm very excited to see all this energy that's, that's, that exists in, in our field um, in, in these new methods. Um, when I was a, a faculty member applying for grants, I was extremely confused by all of the NSF different opportunities. I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know how to apply. Um, and so, and I think I missed a bunch of opportunities, so I thought that I would give a little primer on what we have that is specifically focused on computational and sort of data science research. <clears throat> um, and uh, a lot of you are grad students, so you might think this doesn't apply to me, but, but actually uh, you will probably be applying for NSF grants, you know, in the not too distant future. Um, if, if you live abroad, then you're mostly here out of luck. Um, <laughs> But we do have some programs, like we have a collaboration with Israel, for example, uh, and some other countries. So, um, so I'm going to give you like a super brief overview of, of uh, how the NSF is organized, mainly so that you understand where things fit in. Um, and then I'm going to just touch on all the different programs that I think you should know about. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about them. This is mostly so that you are aware of them, kind of understand the basic idea, and then you can always go read more uh, on your own. So the NSF is a big federal agency. Uh, the sole purpose is to give money for basic research. Um, and uh, I don't, is there a laser pointer on this thing? Doesn't matter. Um, so 93% of the money that comes to the NSF goes directly out the door to researchers. Okay, the, it's, it's a small percentage that is for operations. Um, the budget uh, in the previous year, so that's uh, 2022, fiscal year 2022, which is last year, was 8.8 .8 billion. Um, and uh, we evaluated 43,000-ish proposals uh, and gave 11,000 uh, awards, uh, supported 318,000 people. Um, and uh, and this, these are sort of the big numbers. But of course, there are many, many different parts of the NSF, and these are the main units. So you have biological science and engineering, mathematical physical science, which is where astronomy lives, computer information science and engineering, which is where sort of a lot of AI programs live, and I've put those in bold because that's where the programs live that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, then we have geosciences, STEM education, which is focused on education research, uh, social, behavioral, and economic sciences, there's a new directorate that just started uh, called Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. Uh, and the goal of that is to decrease the time between basic research and then when it hits, you know, real use in the real world. And so there are potentially partnerships there because obviously a lot of sort of data science methods have direct industry applications. Uh, but it's not entirely clear what they're going to do yet. So uh, I'm not going to tell you anything specific, but, but stay tuned. Uh, and then there's uh, two other offices for doing international collaborations and, and for doing interdisciplinary things. Um, the, the budgets, again, last year for the different uh, units are the ones up here. Um, you can see, actually, mathematical physical science is the biggest unit. It has one point, it had, last year, $1.61 billion. Um, and the computer science one had a little over a billion dollars. So let's focus on those two, okay? The mathematical and physical sciences has five divisions. Astronomy, which is where I am, and then chemistry and materials, math, and physics. Uh, the budget for astronomy is, a, is about $290 million, and the, different, the five different divisions are kind of similar, not exactly. And then uh, the, the, the MPS, Mathematical Physical Sciences, has money outside of these five divisions for interdisciplinary kind of work, and that affects some of what I'll tell you. Um, the uh, size director, the computer one, 
uh, has four uh, you know, subdivisions. I'm only listing two because those are the ones that, that are related to uh, this kind of science. There's the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, and they do uh, you know, programs that have to do with uh, cyber infrastructure, software development for scientific application. Uh, and they're interested in AI applied to science, right? And then there's the uh, Information Intelligence Systems, and they're interested in foundational AI, like developing new AI. Both of those have money that, that you can apply for. And so now, uh, here are specific programs belonging to these different places that are, you know, potentially things that you could apply for that uh, to support this kind of work. Um, the, astro the astronomy division, uh, you know, unlike most other things in the NSF, the vast majority of our budget goes to facilities. We pay for Rubin and DKIS, the solar telescope, and Noir Lab and ALMA, and that is where 70% of our budget goes, the operations. And so only 30% is for grants. And that really limits, uh, that puts a lot of pressure on grants for astronomy that, say, physics and, and math don't have. Um, uh, there's the AAG program, which is our umbrella program for everything, which I'll tell you a bit about. Uh, the AAPF, which you grad students should all apply for when you're ready. It's the postdoctoral uh, fellowship program. Um, and the career is for sort of early faculty before you have tenure, five-year grants. Um, I'm not going to talk about APF and career. They really are to do any research. Um, but they're specifically for postdoc and, and early faculty. Um, the Office of uh, the OAC division has the CSSI program, which is for developing cyber infrastructure, basically software development. I'll talk about that. And then there's a new one called cyber training, which is to fund the training of people to use uh, infrastructure or to be able to, to, to build it themselves. And then uh, the really exciting one is the AI Institutes program, um, which, which I'll tell you about. Uh, we expect to have some institutes in focused on astronomy. Uh, and that's coming through the, the IIS division here. And another new program called Expand AI, which is uh, for uh, minority serving institutions to be able to connect with, with these AI institutes. Uh, and then we have these programs that live above. We're, they're kind of meta programs. Um, ADAPT and AJAP are two things that are affiliated with the directorate, Mathematical Physical Sciences. Um, I'll tell you about them. And then there's the CDSNE, which kind of lives across the whole foundation. So let's talk about these uh, one by one. So the AAG, uh, unlike many, many divisions, in astronomy we decided we're not going to have a different program for galaxies and stars and whatever. It's one program. If it, if it has to do with astronomy, you send your proposal there. And we have four different, you know, uh, bins that we put things in at the back end. That's planetary and stellar and galactic and extragalactic. Um, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I manage the extragalactic grant program. So when I get the extragalactic grants, I now sort of separate them into categories so that they can be reviewed appropriately. Large scale structure, cosmology, AGN, um, uh, galaxy formation theory, et cetera. And, I, and there is also a panel that we call astroinformatics where we put the methodologically heavy proposals. So things that, that make heavy use of AI or heavy use of sort of uh, computational tools. So if you're building a new simulation code um, or a new AI method, and the focus of the proposal is more on the method than on the application to the science, and it therefore needs a different kind of person to review it, there is a special place for that. Um, we, the program as a whole has $50 million, which is not a lot. We give about 100 awards. Uh, and the deadline is always November 15th every year. Uh, this shows some historical uh, success information. It actually uh, is not showing the recent years. It's, it goes to 2018. Um, what? 
That was the stimulus package that President Obama signed after the financial crash. That was a great time for the NSF. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the old, in the good old days, uh, you know, before I was applying for grants, the success rates were often like 30 percent. Those days are long gone. And, and in fact, there was a really bad period of sort of 15 percent success rates. Uh, and we, you know, the we, the division has really struggled to try to keep it at 20 percent, um, and has not always succeeded. You can't see the ones after here uh, because we have an incredibly hard time <laughs> in the federal government system getting approvals to share information and data <laughs> with people. However. Uh, it's kind of sort of hovering at this level here. So it's, it's, it's basically like under 20%. Our goal is 20%. Um, the problem that we have in astronomy is that we're committed to supporting all these facilities. And these are contracts that go out for many years. Uh, and our budget has remained fairly flat over the years. But the cost of the facilities grows with, grows with inflation. And so that has put a lot of pressure on the grants program. Um, and the recent decadal survey said that the number one priority is to protect the grants program. And so we're now putting a firewall around the grants program um, and hoping that, uh, and, and that's putting pressure on other parts of the division, which is our instrument part, because we also fund a sort of medium-sized instruments. And really we're trying to like push that pressure upwards so it goes outside of our division uh, into the whole NSF. Um, but success rates are about one in five. That is really competitive. Um, and if you've ever served on a panel, you know that you know uh, that at least half the proposals are, are really good and deserve funding. So it's it's that's the worst part of the job is that you have to say no to a lot of really good things. Okay, so let le let me tell you a little bit about these meta programs. So there's this thing called Adapt, um, and it's. It's this thing, it's called the Dear Colleague Letter, which I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> but really what it is, is a, uh, an effort on the part of the National Science Foundation to encourage a certain kind of work. And this one in particular is trying to encourage the application of AI in mathematical and physical sciences, okay? Uh, so there are three particular mechanisms that you can use to, to tap into this. One is if you already have a grant, you can apply for a supplement to add some AI component to it that wasn't there to begin with. Um, that doesn't help you if you don't have a grant, but if you do, that's, you can do that. Um, and then there are these two other ways, which are existing NSF mechanisms that I didn't know about before. They're called eager and raise. Uh, eager is a type of grant for sort of very exploratory work that's not really ready to to do a full proposal and, and be evaluated in a, in a review panel because it's, it's not sort of far, you know, it doesn't have enough proof of concept or whatever. And RAISE is, is too interdisciplinary to be evaluated in your typical astronomy panel because it involves both computer science and astronomy, for example, or both math and, and uh, astronomy. Um, those don't have a deadline. What you need to do for these is you need to contact me and tell me your idea and say, does this fit in with an eager or raise or, or whatever? And we'll talk through it. And if it does, uh, then, then uh, you know, I'll, I'll see if it's, it would be possibly fundable. And then I would invite you to, to apply. And then it would be, it would go through normal review. Okay. Uh, CDSNE, Computational and Data Enabled Science and Engineering. So this one uh, is another kind of meta program, that means it's not a pot of money that you apply to. There is no money with this thing, okay? You apply to the normal place you would apply. It could be AAG, it could be a physics, it could be a math program, whatever. But your proposal uh, has a particularly kind of novel computational or data science aspect to it, especially one that could be applied to other fields as well, okay? So it's not just for your little astronomy problem. It could also maybe be applied to physics or to math or to, or to, um, or to geology. And then when you submit your AG, you add that little tag. 
and we evaluate whether it fits into that category. And if it does, it gets a more close look by people from other divisions who might be interested in as well. And so there's, a, there's sort of a, a possibility that you could get bumped up because other people are interested besides just us. Um, that doesn't have a deadline. It's whenever the deadline is of the program you're applying, which for, if, it's, if it's AAG, it would be the 15th of November. Um, okay, this one uh, is another uh, MPS, Mathematical Physical Sciences program. And its goal is to help broaden participation in the field. It only works if you have a grant. So you have to have an active uh, NSF grant. But if you do, uh, and you can identify a student, you can add an extra student to your grant through a supplement, okay? Um, it's a great program. Okay, let's talk about the ones that live in the, in the computing uh, directorate. So there's this uh, CSSI program, Cyber Infrastructure for Sustained Scientific Innovation, has $34 million, gives about 35 awards. The deadline is December 1. Um, and these grants are, uh, there is sort of, there is three different categories, but the idea is you're developing uh, software or some kind of infrastructure for the purpose of science, for application. But you're not going to get funded to do the science, just to develop the tool, okay? So you're writing a new simulation code. You can get funding for that. You're, writing a, you're, you're creating a new method, a new AI method, and you're going to write code that, that will become open source. You can get funding for that. You're writing software that will handle, uh, you know, uh, the, that will handle a database of, like, uh, linking together different observatories so that you get alerts from one and everyone, you know, that. It, a, web, a web platform for hosting whatever. It's that kind of thing. Um, and there's small grants where it's, it could be just you doing your tool, and then there's the big grants where it really requires an interdisciplinary team. Um, these are, are great. Um, there are not that many astronomy projects in them every year, and they tend to review really well uh, when they're there. Um, and then there, the projects that are successful are funded jointly between the CS you know, directorate and whichever other division is related to the project. Um, at this new program called Cyber Training is, uh, has about you know, $9 million, about 18 awards. Deadline is January 18. And that is specifically for training communities in the use of tools that exist or to help train people with get the tools they need so that they can build infrastructure. Uh, and often it's targeting, uh, you know, populations that don't have the training, but it's pretty broad, you know, in what it could be. Um, you might, there might be a new big platform that people don't know how to use and you want money to like do, to do uh, uh, tutorials, training, uh, workshops, etc. Okay, uh, this is the, the really exciting one. Um, the AI Institute program. Uh, this has uh, happened a couple times in the past, but it didn't happen last year. And it is for building sort of uh, frontier center level institutes that last five years. Each one is $20 million. And the way it was done last time is that there were a number of themes and you could apply to one of the themes. Last time, one of the themes was physics. And there were some proposals that came in to build physics AI institutes, and, and, they, and, and one was funded. It's at MIT. And there were other themes as well. Uh, this year, the plan is to bring the program back after, after a hiatus and to have an astronomy theme. And through a partnership with the Simons Foundation, we plan to do two astronomy institutes, where it's sort of a joint operation between Simons and NSF. This is not a done deal. Um, I, I expect it will happen, but lawyers are talking. <laughs> so uh, I'm not, 
I can't promise anything, but I, I expect that this will happen. I expect the solicitation will come out in the summer, mid to late summer. And um, the way that these work is that there is a proposal, a first stage proposal that, that uh, you know, is a pre-proposal, let's say, which would probably be due in the fall sometime, late fall. And then some will be selected, invited to submit a, a full proposal. Uh, and then if it happens like it did last time, the second round would be a reverse site visit, which means the team comes to the NSF to present their case, you know. So this is pretty exciting that we could have two big institutes in AI. Um, the, uh, the, you know, there are a couple different things here. One is that for us, this has to, these have to be like outward facing community, uh, repositories of knowledge and tools, not just for you, okay? We want to create these institutes to help the whole community, right? So that has to be a part of your proposal if you're gonna do this. Um, another really important part is this is funded by, by many partners, including the CS division that cares about foundational AI. And that means it can't just be application of off-the-shelf tools to solve astronomy problems, because they're not gonna be interested in that, right? Also, you don't really need an institute for that. You can just take the off-the-shelf tool and apply it to astronomy, like you're all doing amazing work. You're actually developing your own tools. Um, and we get a lot of those proposals. Uh, I, about 10% of AAG proposals last year made heavy use of machine learning AI, AI. Okay, that's that might not seem a lot, but it was it was like two percent five years ago. So um, we get a lot of those. An institute is when you really need people who don't normally work together, aren't talking to each other, to come together to solve problems. Okay, that's that's the bar, and the problems have to be both intractable astronomy problems, you know, over the next ten years and AI problems, right? That will result in publications in the AI literature and in the astronomy literature. So that's kind of the, what we're looking for. Um, and then the last thing I wanna uh, talk about is this other new program called Expand AI. Uh, you ha so Expand AI is for minority serving institutions and it's, it's uh, 10 to 17 million dollars, 15 to 25 awards. Um, the deadline is pretty much a rolling deadline. You can apply any time, but it ends in October, and then there's a gap, and then it starts again in January. Uh, and there are two kinds of awards. One is to build capacity, like you have an MSI and you wanna build up capacity in AI because there's a need and it's not there. Uh, this is what this is for. And another one is to partner with an existing AI institute as a minority serving institution so that you can be connected. And it is entirely possible when you apply for an AI institute to, to partner and apply for uh, and expand AI as well. Uh, AI institutes don't have to be one institution. They could be several collaborating together. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a, a nice way to encourage people to partner with uh, minority serving institutions. Um, so, uh, three things I wanna say. One is, talk to your program director about anything. <laughs> That's our job. People do not reach out to us enough, and when they do, they always say, I wish I had talked to you earlier because what you told me is super useful. Um, if you're doing extragalactic astronomy, that's me. If you're doing AI stuff, data science stuff, that's me. If you're doing galactic or, or stellar or planetary, that's other people. Or career, that's someone else. Or postdoc is someone else. But talk to us. You have an idea of something you wanna fund and you don't know where it fits in, uh, we can help you. Second, come serve on an NSF panel. If you have never served on an NSF panel, you learn a lot by doing it. It's especially valuable for people just starting out who are gonna write their first grants. Um, I failed in my, my first three years of writing grants, and then I served on a panel, and, and then I got a grant. I'm not saying that that's gonna happen to you, <laughs> but I changed how I was writing my proposals because 
I saw, oh, this works. That does not work. I've been doing that. And, that, you know, so it really helps. Um, you can actually go to our website and fill out a form saying, I'm interested in serving. And you go on, then next time we're looking for panelists, we'll see your name. And we are hiring three program directors. Um, and these are rotator positions. Rotator positions are for people who have appointments at universities. And they're going to take three years break, come to the NSF, and then go back to the university. So you don't really lose your position. And you're actually paid through your university. The NSF pays your university to pay you for three years. Uh, and we do it because we always like to have new ideas, new knowledge from the field at any time. We don't only want to have people who've been at the NSF for 10 years. And universities like to do it with their faculty because then you come back with a lot of knowledge about successful grant writing. Uh, and, you know, and for the person who does it, it might be a good, you know, uh, place in their career uh, where this seems like a good, a good thing to do. So uh, if, if you are interested or you, you know anyone who's interested, please let them know. This will come out on the job register, AAS, uh, in April. So I'm happy to take any questions and, and also talk to you afterwards and also email me. Thank you. Thank you. We have. Hi. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Um, and uh, I'm Howen Zhang um, from the University of Arizona. Uh, I just have a pure, like, curious question about the expenditure in AAG. Um, so is there a significant increase in the expenditure since the pandemic compared to, say, uh, 2015 to 2018? Um, <clears throat> I know you're not allowed to show the quantitative data, but like... Yeah, you mean yeah. up here? No, no, it's been pretty flat. Okay. It's been so flat, yeah. Even with the, like, uh, all the QE that the government's been yeah, doing? Yeah, it, okay. it, it's, it's been pretty flat. Um, but the number of proposals has been going up. Yeah. So it should it should also grow. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's been it's been around fifty million the last few years. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Dobi Poznanski. Um, are you considering switching to a rolling deadline for the AAG? Just out of curiosity. Uh, we we talked about we talk, I think that discussion happens every year. <laughs> um, we've talked about that. Um, it's. And it's kind of, we have not made a decision about that, yeah. Some, some places in the NSF are doing that. Um, That's what I heard. It, like, it's, it's, it likely leads to a lot more internal work for us. And we don't have a lot of staff. It's kind of at work a little bit understaffed. Might change those numbers, though, right? Yes. I mean, that's, well, so the places that have done this, they see a drop in proposals. I mean, this is the crazy thing, that when you don't have a deadline, people don't actually apply. <laughs> But, but the programs that have been, that have done this long enough, they see the numbers creeping back up after like two, three years. So it's not totally clear it will reduce long term, the numbers, yeah. Um, but we've talked about maybe having two deadlines, so it's not just once a year. Um, but we, there's no, con there's no like clear consensus on that. And just a, a quick comment to the audience, I guess, about what you said in the beginning about the opportunities with Israel. There's this program called NSF BSF. Uh, in case you have an Israeli partner, uh, for example, or, or I should say a partner in an Israeli institution, uh, you apply for whatever normal NSF program you would apply, you attach basically a simple thing saying that's the synergies we have with this group uh, in Israel. And if you uh, it goes through a normal, you correct me please if I'm wrong, it, it goes through the, the normal NSF uh, um, review. Uh, review, and if you get uh, approved, the Israeli partner essentially gets automatically the money from the BSF, and it's larger than a normal BSF program. I don't exactly understand the logic, but the bottom line is, for the Israeli partner, it's essentially zero work and more money than a normal grant just from working with you. So it's great for collaboration, is the bottom line. <laughs> this is why he likes it. <laughs> uh, or Croatia, by the way. That's the new one. We have a Croatian, Croatian partnership. So thank you very much, Sultan Hassan. Um, so I wanted to ask something. So many universities already have data science institutes, right? 
just um, um, yes. I want to ask about the AI Institute, right? Yes. And they encourage this interdisciplinary science between different faculties and stuff, right? So for a university that already have the, they, they already have the, the data science institutes uh, within the university, how can they make the case to host AI Institute? Yes, I mean that that's kind of that kind of depends, you know, on the details of what's happening there. Like a lot of data, you know. So I I I started a data science institute at my university, but it was not at all focused on foundational AI. It was entirely to help people who uh, don't have access to tools, you know, get access to them. And I think a lot of institutes focus on that, and that's not what this is. So if there's actually an AI institute doing lots of AI, then I think it's going to have a lot of trouble here because a panel will say, you already have an institute, why should we give you $20 million? Um, but I, I don't think there are a lot of institutes that really do this. Uh, that are This has to be astronomy and foundational AI together. I don't think there are a lot of those. Thanks for a great talk, Andreas. Um, Peter Bruzzi here. I was just wondering if you could shed some light on what happens between November 15th and then when the grants are announced? Yes. Because that, that's often like a black box for people yeah. to apply. Um, I endure a lot of pain as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the proposals come in November 15th and then we have to, uh, you know, do lots of um, compliance checking and we have to sort them. So like I spend a bunch of time deciding uh, for the extragalactic proposals, what is the best place for this this one to be reviewed? And that's and that's I take that very seriously because I want every proposal to get the best possible review it can. That's really hard with the diversity of proposals, and you only have 12 panels, so that takes some time. And then uh, it takes quite a bit of time to 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 get panelists. You need to invite, you know, each each panel. My panels have about seven people. Um, most people say no, right, which is understandable. So you need to invite a lot of people to fill the panels. And you're looking for just the right expertise, right? And you want to make sure every proposal has someone there who understands it. So in getting the panel and the panelists might take three weeks to respond. So there's a long period of setting up the panel, or like get, just getting the membership there. And then you have to give them a bunch of time to read the proposals, you know, like I like to give people at least three weeks to read proposals. And then the panel happens. So that's typically like now. I mean, that's happening now. We have panels like every week now. And then the panel happens, right? And then you have all these panels with all these rankings. And you have to somehow come up with a final list of who you're giving money to, right? And so you have to like create a portfolio that's, that has nice diversity along all the axes you care about. And um, Sometimes we don't even have a budget yet. Actually, probably half the years, because of how messed up you know Congress is, we don't actually have a budget like six months into the year. So we don't actually know how many we can do. Or, or we know that probably we'll have it, but we're not allowed to make any awards. Um, and so the first awards might happen in April, but like one award from the panel maybe because we're you know. And then, like, May is when a lot of the awards come out. And that's just how long it takes to do that whole process. And also, it's the, the holidays, you know, in December sort of add three weeks to the whole thing. Yeah. But, like, right now, for example, most of the AG panels have not happened yet. They're, you know, they're going to happen in the next uh, month and a half. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, Lena and the CPR. So thank you so much for this. Um, actually, when I was watching it, I was thinking, why don't we do this in onboarding when we start faculty positions? Because <laughs> I had to learn it by word of mouth, and it wasn't this eloquently done. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, so my question is, for the AI Institutes, what happens after the five years? Because I want to know what was going to happen to IFI at MIT and, vers and whether I should bother with Trying for another one in Astro? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 there's no plan for sustainability. You know, I think uh, the money ends in after five years, what happens? 
Um, I think I think that uh, it's possible that that you could apply for a renewal, but that's that has not that discussion has not happened yet. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a problem with a lot of programs, right? They have a end. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks uh, as well. Just to follow up, this is John Wood, by the way. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess with like the expand AI as well, thinking about sustainability or, or some of the other programs, if um, one of the goals is to partner with MSIs um, and really develop the workforce there, uh, I just want to know: Are there any like long-term options for for really creating you know driving force that that stays and, and can um, work with like you know underprivileged or under-resourced institutions? So there's no there's no grant program that lasts more than five years. Um, however, there are some that are designed that you can apply again and again. So one I didn't talk about because it's not really focused on, on computational AI is the PAIR program, P-A-A-R-E, which is an astronomy program. And that's a really nice program for, to create partnerships uh, between MSIs and R1 institutions or other partnerships. Uh, and those are five years and, and they can absolutely then, you know, be renewed, of course, if they have, you know, propose again and show that they were successful, um, and we've had pro we've had uh, institutions do that. So that's that's one that you can do that with. Some of these programs, like the cyber infrastructure ones, specifically have money for sustainability building, um, but it's not we're going to give this money to you forever. It's ask what you need in order to do the things you need to do to make it sustainable, and, and then we're going to stop giving you money. Yeah, and some of the programs you, you explicitly have to describe how you're going to make the program sustainable so at the end, you know. But, but generally, the NSF is not an agency that kind of gives these grants that go on forever. That's not us. Yeah. Any other question? I have one. So why two institutes for astronomy? Why not one? <laughs> Uh, because two is a bigger number than one. And it's <laughs> you want competition, or I mean? No, no, no. Um, no, no. We, we we would like the two institutes to focus on different things. Yeah, and and also possibly. I mean, again, this is these are just my ideas. Possibly different geographic regions as well. You know, um, and and you know, some people have asked me like, oh, can I partner with? Can we partner with these institutions? If you're, the goal of an institute is to create community, right? That's why you need an institute, to get people to talk to each other who aren't working together, like computer scientists and astronomers. And if you have like, uh, you know, uh, Columbia and Berkeley working together, um, you're going to have to make a good case of how this geographic separation is not going to be a problem in that, you know? So, so potentially geographic differences, like NSF did their big data hubs a few years ago to create regional places that connect with all the regional universities, and also diff potentially different focus. Um, we definitely want, as on the NSF side, uh, you know, one of the big goals of this is to, to deal with the massive data that's coming, right, from the facilities that we support, like Rubin. Um, that's one of the things that, that we care about, but not every proposal has to do that, you know. But more practically, the answer to your question is, we're funding an institute, and then Simon said, hey, would you like to do two? And we're like, yes. <laughs> My office is next to David Esperger, so I, I yeah, yeah, already yeah. thought, okay, I think maybe. <laughs> so a lot of what we need in astronomy, um, and in particular in data, is sustained infrastructure. And I think a, a relentless and reasonable criticism of the NSF is that its, it's focus on basic research means the research is research. You're not interested in things that work. You're interested in results. And you need things that work to get there. But when you get the results, you're done with the things that work. Um, yeah. When we talk about software, when we talk about AI, you know, we talk about all of this huge open source stuff um, and that needs sustaining. So as the NSF considered, you say, you know, we're not there for, that's not our mission. And I love mission-driven organizations. I run a mission-driven organization. I support your mission. Who should people go to after you? 
Should there be some partnership between the NSF and thing in the federal government or somewhere else that says, yeah, we're here to continue to support this foundational thing. You know, we don't want archive to just be, we were just talking about archive. We don't want archive to just, you know, be like, wow, that was a great research project for five years. And now we're shutting it down. I mean, like, it's actually really useful. It'd be great if it stuck around. How do we do that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really big problem, right? I mean, just to be fair, there are some programs like, not not really in astronomy, but like this program here, these programs, cyber infrastructure, they really are focused on sustainability. Um, and uh, they, as I said, they have explicit money to help you become sustainable, and you have to explain how you're going to be sustainable. But that doesn't mean they're going to sustain you. Um, so uh, you know, I don't think we know the answer to that question. Um, and where I know within within astronomy. Uh, we're trying to create partnerships, like the Simons thing is this new thing that we're doing, but other foundations as well um, to solve these problems. But you know, there's no easy solutions to this, right? Uh, and sometimes it's institutions like universities, uh, but there is no real answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, the, you know, so many of these. Um, grants are about partnering and different types of institutes partnering with each other that maybe don't know each other or how to find each other. And I found this when I was, you know, thinking about the pair. Um, is there like a place to go to find other folks who are also interested in doing partnerships in that particular? I don't think there is, but that, that is a really good project to propose to do. <laughs> there, there, is, there isn't such a thing, at least, at least nothing that we're connected to. Yeah, but that, that's a great idea. I mean, it's not easy to, to, to start a partnership, right? It takes a lot of, takes a lot of like, um, down, you know, down payment of time and effort on both sides. And you would miss someone. And you would totally miss someone, yeah. So thank you, thank you, Andreas, again, for a very nice. <laughs> All right, so I think that's it. So I would like to thank Peter for putting together the conference and you have been doing all the work, so thank you very much. It's time for lunch. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>